Is ChatGPT good enough to be a chess tutor? ChatGPT can be a good chess tutor, especially for beginners or intermediate players. It can explain rules, strategies, tactics, and offer examples of famous games. It can also analyze your moves and suggest improvements. However, for advanced players, a professional coach might be more suitable. Do you have any specific questions or topics about chess you'd like to know more about? You're a grandmaster at chess and are coaching me in chess. I'm an intermediate player. We're going to play a game of chess now. I'll play with the white pieces. After each of my moves, can you please critically assess them? And after each of your moves, can you please describe the rationale for why you did that? Great. Let's get started. You'll play as white and I'll be black. Whenever you make a move, I'll give you feedback on it. After my move, I'll explain my strategy. Remember, as an intermediate player, you probably know the basics, so I'll focus on more advanced insights. Go ahead and make your first move. My first move is d4. Starting with one, d4 is a solid and strategic opening. It controls the center, opens lines for your bishop and queen, and prepares for further development. This move is popular at all levels and can lead to various openings like the queen's gambit or the king's Indian defense depending on how black responds. Now I'll play one and f6, attacking your pawn and preparing to control the center. This move also allows for flexible development, keeping my options open. It's a common response in high level play, leading to various defenses like the King's Indian or the Grunfeld. Your move. C4. C4 is a classic follow-up to 1d4. This move reinforces your control of the center mm. and sets the stage for a queen's gambit if I choose to play d5. It's a strong, assertive move that opens up lines for your queen and bishop, aligning well with the principles of opening play. In response, I'll play two, e6, preparing to develop my dark squared bishop and potentially challenge your center with dot e5. This move is a step towards structures seen in the Nimzo Indian defense or the queen's Indian defense, both popular and rich in strategic ideas. Your move. In c3. NC3 is a solid move, developing your knight and further supporting your pawn on D4. This move also keeps the center flexible, allowing you to adapt based on my responses. It's a common theme in openings like the Queen's Gambit decline, which could arise if I play D5. I'll play three, BB4, pinning your knight to the king. This is a key move in the Nimzo Indian defense, aimed at exerting pressure on your center and complicating your plans to advance E to E4. The Nimzo Indian is known for its rich strategic play and imbalance in pawn structures. How will you respond? Bishop d2. Bd2 is a cautious approach, breaking the pin on your knight. This move prepares to exchange bishops or force mine to retreat. While it's a bit passive and delays your central pawn play, it's a safe choice that maintains a solid position. Responding to this, I'll play four. Oh, castling early to safeguard my king. This move also keeps my structural flexibility and prepares for various central and flank strategies. It's often good to castle early for safety and king protection. What's your next plan? NF3. It looks like there might be a small error in your move notation. NF3 isn't a valid chess move. Maybe you meant NF3 moving your knight to F3. If that's the case, it's a strong move developing another piece and controlling the center. If it's a different move, could you please clarify? No, that was correct. NF3. NF3 develops your knight to a strong central position, supporting your pawn on d4 and preparing for kingside castling. This move is in line with fundamental opening principles. Develop your pieces, control the center, and prepare to safeguard your king. I'll play five, d5 challenging the center directly. This move strikes at the heart of your pawn structure and opens lines for my other pieces. It's a central tenet of many openings against d4, aiming to claim an equal share of the center. Your turn. E3. E3 is a solid, cautious move, reinforcing your d4 pawn and preparing to develop your light squared bishop, possibly to d3. This setup supports a strong pawn center, though it's slightly passive and delays your bishop's development. In response, I'll play 6, D5, striking at your central pawn formation and aiming to increase the tension in the center. This move is typical in many openings against D4, seeking to challenge white space advantage and create counterplay. How will you proceed? A3. 
A3 is a strategic move, asking my bishop on b4 to make a decision. This can lead to the exchange of my bishop for your knight, potentially giving you the bishop pair, but doubling your c-pawn. It's a common idea in positions like this, aiming to resolve the tension created by the pin. I'll capture the knight 7 bet c3. This exchange relieves the pin on your knight, but gives me the bishop pair, a slight advantage in long-range peace activity. Now, it's your turn to decide how to recapture. Bishop Tom c3. Bxc3 is a good decision. By recapturing with your bishop, you maintain your strong pawn center and develop another piece. While you give up the bishop pair, your position remains solid and well-coordinated. Now I'll play a, and c6, developing another piece and increasing the pressure on your d4 pawn. This move also prepares for various pawn breaks like e5 or cx d4, which can open up the position. Your move! Before I play my next move, can you clarify? You said you gave that I gave up the bishop pair, but from my recording of the game, I've got the bishop pair and you don't have the bishop pair. Can you please explain your um, description? Ah, you're right. And I apologize for the confusion. After 8 bit c3, you indeed have the bishop pair, your bishops on c3 and f1, while I, playing as black, have only one bishop left on c8. The bishop pair can be an advantage, offering control over both color complexes on the board. This can be particularly effective in open positions where your bishops have greater mobility. Thanks for pointing that out. And now you can proceed with your next move. Bishop d3. BD3 is a solid move, developing your light squared bishop to an active square. This positions the bishop well to support a future e3, e4 pawn push, opening the center and utilizing your space advantage. It also contributes to your control of the central and kingside squares. In response, I'll play 9, cx d4. This move exchanges my c5 pawn for your d4 pawn, aiming to resolve the central tension and potentially isolate your d pawn if you recapture with the e pawn. It's a common idea in these structures to challenge the opponent's pawn center. How will you recapture? Nx d4. Nx d4 is a good move, recapturing with your knight. This keeps your pawn structure intact and places your knight in a central active position. It also opens up lines for your rook and keeps the center dynamic. I'll play 10, qb6, putting pressure on your knight and indirectly targeting the b2 pawn. This move aims to create immediate tactical threat and challenge your control of the center. Your response is important here to maintain balance. What's your next move? Castle Kingside. This is a fundamental part of developing your position in the opening phase, creating a strong, cohesive structure. I'll play 11, BD7, developing my last minor piece and connecting my rook. This move also prepares for rice C8, increasing pressure on your C pawn and central squares. Your position remains solid, but be mindful of potential threats to your b2 pawn. Your move. b4. b4 is an aggressive pawn move, aiming to expand on the queen side and secure space. This move also defends your c3 bishop, but it leaves the a3 pawn a bit exposed. It's a double-edged decision that can lead to the dynamic play. I'll respond with 12. Rass 8, placing my rook on the open c file and increasing pressure on your c3 bishop. This move follows the principle of rooks belonging on open or semi-open files. It's now your turn to navigate this increasingly tactical position. What's your next plan? C5. C5 is a bold move, further advancing your pawn to claim more queenside space and restrict my pieces. This move also closes the C file, reducing the immediate pressure on your C3 bishop. However, it does create a fixed pawn structure that could become a target. Reacting to this, I'll play 13, qc7, repositioning my queen to support the e5 break and aligning it with your king. This move also keeps the pressure on the e3 pawn and prepares for potential central and kingside play. Your position is still solid, but be aware of the potential for a pawn break at e5. What's your next move? In times c6. At c6 is a tactical decision, capturing my knight on c6. This move exchanges your strong central knight for my knight which can lead to an interesting pawn structure change if I recapture with the b-pawn. I'll take back with 14, bxc6, opening the b-file for potential rook activity. This also gives me a pair of connected passed pawns on the queen side, which can be powerful in the endgame. 
Your strategic decisions here will be crucial. What's your next step? Queen F3. QF3 is a proactive move, placing your queen on an active square with a good view of the board. This move pressures my knight on F6 and hints at potential kingside action. It also keeps an eye on the center and queen side, maintaining flexibility in your play. In response, I'll play 15 E5, challenging the center and opening lines for my pieces. This move aims to create dynamic play and counter your strong center. It's a critical moment in the game, calling for careful consideration of your next move. What will you do? Bishop F5. Bf5 is an interesting choice, placing your bishop actively and challenging my d7 bishop. This move creates tension and can lead to exchanges that open up the position further. It also demonstrates a willingness to engage in complex tactical play. To meet this challenge, I'll play 16, bxf5, capturing your bishop. This exchange can help me relieve some of the pressure on my position and simplify the board a bit. Your decision on how to recapture is important here. What's your plan? QXF5. QXF5, capturing my bishop, is a strong decision. It maintains the pressure on my knight on F6 and keeps an active stance on the board. This move also opens up your rook on F1 to contribute more directly to the game. In response, I'll play 17 RFE8, centralizing my rook and supporting the E5 pawn. This move also increases pressure on your E3 pawn and prepares for potential E4 pushes. The position is becoming quite dynamic, offering chances for both sides. Your move? F4. You're welcome. If you ever want to continue our chess discussion, analyze more positions, or explore different aspects of the game, feel free to reach out. Chess is a deeply fascinating and complex game, and there's always something new to learn. Sorry, you misunderstood. I meant my move was F4. F4 is a bold move, challenging my central pawn on E5, and aiming to open up the F-file for your rook. This move can lead to a more dynamic position, especially if it opens lines for an attack on my king. I'll respond with 18 EXF4, capturing the pawn. This exchange opens the E-file for my rook, and creates an isolated pawn on e3 for you, which could become a target. The position is now opening up, creating new tactical possibilities. Your turn to navigate this evolving landscape. What's your next move? Exf4. Xf4 recaptures the pawn, maintaining the material balance and opening the e-file. This move also solidifies your pawn structure and prepares your rook for more active play. I'll play 19. RE4, placing my rook on an active central square and directly challenging your F4 pawn. This move also cuts off your queen's access to the H7 square and prepares for a potential doubling of rooks on the E-file. The game is entering a critical phase with lots of direct confrontation. Your move? Bishop XF6. BXF6 is a decisive move, capturing my knight and disrupting my pawn structure around the king if I recapture with the G pawn. It's a tactical decision that aims to weaken my king's safety and create imbalances. I'll recapture with 20, GXF6, which creates doubled F pawns and opens lines towards my king, but also gives me the open G file for potential counterplay. This exchange has significantly altered the pawn structure and dynamics of the position. Your strategy in exploiting these changes will be key. What's your next plan? QXF6. Duke XF6 is an aggressive move, capturing my pawn on F6. This puts significant pressure on my position, especially targeting my king's side. Your move also poses threats of mating patterns around my king. In response, I'll play 21, QD8, offering a queen trade to alleviate the pressure on my king. This move also brings my queen closer to the defense of my king. The position is highly tactical, and careful calculation is needed. How will you proceed? Queen times queen. QXD8 plus captures my queen and initiates the trade. This simplifies the position significantly. I'll recapture with 22, RFC8. Now, the queens are off the board, shifting the focus to the endgame. Your pawn structure is more solid, but my rooks are active. It's a balanced endgame with opportunities for both sides. Your move? Rook A to E1. Ray 1, moving your rook to the E1 square is a great move. It aligns your rook with the other on the E file, doubling them up against my rook on E4. This increases the pressure and can lead to tactical opportunities. I'll respond with 23 RDE8, doubling my rooks on the E-file as well.
This move reinforces my rook on e4 and prepares to contest the control of the e-file. The e-file has become a major battleground in this endgame. Your strategy in this phase is crucial. What's your next step? Rook times e4. Rxe4 capturing my rook on e4 is a direct approach. This exchange aims to simplify the position further and could lead to an advantageous endgame for you if played correctly. I'll recapture with 24, Rxe4. Now both of us have one rook in similar pawn structures. The endgame strategy will revolve around pawn structure, rook activity, and king safety. Your move. Rook f3. Rf3 is a solid move. Positioning your rook actively and keeping it flexible to move along the third rank. This move also supports your f4 pawn and prepares to engage in the rook endgame. I'll play 25, kg7, moving my king towards the center of the board. This is a typical strategy in the endgame, where the king becomes an active piece. Now, it's your turn to make a move. What's your plan? King f2. Kf2 is a good move, also bringing your king into play. In endgames, active kings are crucial. They can support pawns, help in pawn endgames, and aid in controlling key squares. In response, I'll play 26, KF6, further centralizing my king and preparing to support my pawns and rooks. The positioning of our kings and rooks will be key in determining the outcome of this endgame. Your move. G3. You have reached the message cap for GPT-4. Please try again later. I mean, if you can't play a whole game of chess without reaching the message cap, then it can't really be a good chess coach for you. What I'll do is I'll pause the game and come back later and, and finish it off to see who wins. But, I mean, ultimately, I can't coach you chess at the moment. You have reached the message cap for GPT-4. Please try again later. One eternity later. Let's continue our game now. I'm going to play Rook to E3. Rx E3, moving your Rook to E3, is a strategic decision. This aligns your rook with mine on e4, potentially setting up exchanges or forcing me to defend or move my rook. It's a good way to challenge my control of the e-file. I'll respond with 27, rxc3, exchanging rook. This simplifies the That's position mistake. further, potentially leading to a pawn endgame. Your decision on how to recapture is important. How will you Only proceed? Way. Kx e3. Kx e3, recapturing with your king, is a logical choice. In this pawn endgame, the activity of the king is crucial. Now, both of us need to focus on pawn structure, potential past pawns, and king activity. I'll play 28, KF5, advancing my king and aiming to be more active in controlling key squares and supporting my pawns. In endgames like this, every move is significant. Your turn? H3. H3 is a cautious pawn move, creating luck, a space for your king to avoid any potential back rank issues. It's a good prophylactic move especially in the end game, where king safety remains important. I'll play 29, h5, pushing my pawn to challenge your pawn structure on the king side. This move also aims to create weaknesses in your pawn structure that I can potentially exploit. Your move. a4. a4 is an interesting choice, expanding on the queen side. This move can potentially create a passed pawn or force weaknesses in my pawn structure there. In response, I'll play 30, a5, preventing your pawn from advancing further and locking the pawn structure on the queen side. This creates a static situation on that side of the board, focusing the action to the center and king side. Your turn. I think your move A5 is a mistake. Are you sure you want to play it? I appreciate your attention to detail. Let's reevaluate that move. After your A4, playing 30, A5 could indeed be questionable as it creates a potential target and limits my own pawn mobility on the queen side. Instead, I'll play 30, h4, advancing my pawn and applying pressure on your king side pawn structure. This move aims to create weaknesses or force pawn advances that could be exploitable. Now it's your move. I think h4 is also a mistake because I can just take it with my pawn on g3. Are you sure you want to play it? You're right. Playing 30. h4 might not be the best choice if it allows an easy capture. A more careful approach is needed. Instead, I'll play 30. Ke6, moving my king back and aiming to maneuver around the center and king side. This move keeps the tension and doesn't commit to any pawn weaknesses. Your turn. G4. G4 is an assertive move, challenging my pawn on h5 and aiming to create weaknesses in my pawn structure. 
This move also opens lines for your king to potentially become more active on the king's side. In response, I'll play 31, hx g4, capturing your pawn on g4. This leads to an exchange that could potentially create a passed pawn for me on the h file. Your decision on how to recapture is important here. What will you do? Tom's g4. hx g4, recapturing the pawn is a solid choice. Now, the focus shifts to the potential creation of passed pawns and king activity. I'll play 32, KD5 centralizing my king further. In pawn endgame, an active king is crucial as it can support pawn advances and control key squares. Your strategy in this phase is key. What's your next move? I didn't hear your move correctly. I think you said KD5, but you've got a pawn on D5 already. Can you clear, uh, can you clear this up? You're absolutely right, and I apologize for the oversight. My king can't move to D5 as my pawn is already there. Correcting this, I'll play 32. KF6, moving my king towards the king side to support potential pawn advances and counteract your king's influence. Now it's your move. What will you do? B5. B5 is a strong move, advancing your pawn and challenging my pawn structure on the queen side. This can potentially create a passed pawn and puts pressure on my position. KD7, moving my king towards the queen side to defend against your pawn advance and to potentially contest your B5 pawn. It's your turn now. Your move. King d7 is illegal because before it, your king was on f6, so it can't move to d7. You're absolutely correct, and I appreciate your attention to detail. My king on f6 cannot move directly to d7 in one step. Correcting this, I'll make a legal move. 33 k7, moving my king one step towards the center and closer to the queen side. This move aims to counterbalance your king side presence and maintain flexibility. Now it's your turn. What's your next move? Times c6. Bxc6 plus is a pivotal move, capturing my pawn on c6. Check. This creates a passed pawn for you on the a file, and could be crucial in the end game. I'll respond with 34. Kd6 recapturing your pawn on c6. This keeps my king active and central, ready to stop your passed pawn and support my own pawn. The position is now highly focused on pawn play and king activity. Your move. Your king is on e7, not on d7. Therefore, it's not check, and your king can't capture on c6. You're absolutely right. My king on e7 cannot capture the pawn on c6. Thank you for pointing out the mistake. After your bxc6, I'll correct my move to 34. Kd6, advancing my king to a more central position to contest your passed pawn on the a file and to support my own pawn. Your turn. Uh, your king can't move to d6 because it will be check from my pawn on c5. You're absolutely right again. My king cannot move to d6 due to the check from your pawn on c5. Let's adjust the move accordingly. After 34, bxc6, I'll play 34, kd8, moving my king towards the queen side but avoiding the check from your pawn. This move aims to contain your passed pawn on the a file. Now it's your move. King d4. Kd4 is a strong move, advancing your king towards the center and closer to the action. In the end game, king activity is crucial, and your move puts pressure on my pawns while supporting your own. In response, I'll play 35, KC7, moving my king to contest your passed pawn and support my own pawn structure. The end game is now a tight race of king movement and pawn promotion threats. Your next move? King X, E5. Sorry, that's not right. King X, D5. Kxc5 capturing my pawn is a significant move. It gains a pawn and puts your king in a dominant central position. This greatly enhances your chances in the pawn endgame. I'll respond with 36, Kxc6, moving my king to recapture your pawn on c6. This is a crucial moment in the game, as each pawn and king move can dramatically impact the outcome. Your turn. That's not a legal move, because my king is on d5, so your King uh, cannot take on c6. You're absolutely right. My king cannot move to c6 while your king is on d5. Let's correct that. I'll play 36, kd7, moving my king towards the center and aiming to counter your king's central presence. This move. I'm just going to stop it right there. That's not a legal move either. It's checked from my c6 pawn, obviously. Um, and it's a completely one game for me. I mean, I'm just going to force the king back, come forwards here. Um, put the put black into a position where if it moves the king, I'll queen, uh, and then wait for 
flat to push the pawns and uh, until the point that uh, it can't move anymore. Get it and zigzong and force the king out, our queen and inmate. It's completely one game for me. This is um, one, it's, it's no point continuing. Black should just resign at this point. But more to the point, uh, clearly, uh, ChatGPT is struggling to keep grasp of the board position because it keeps on making illegal moves. So um, it could take half an hour to get to the point that I actually do get it into checkmate. The conclusion, of course, uh, you would have noticed that I had to keep on correcting ChatGPT in terms of what is and is not a legal move. So in terms of the question, does it make a good uh, option for a chess tutor for someone who's an intermediate level? Well, it can't even play a full game of chess without uh, playing illegal moves. So, so the answer is no. But it does get through the opening and the mid game without any problem playing at a relatively decent level. So I think it does have some value in that respect. This is the, important to note, this is the ChatGPT4 Turbo version of ChatGPT. And with every version, it gets better and better. So it won't be too long before it can play a full game of chess at a decent level. In terms of its notes on uh, whether or not my moves were good, you know, the critical assessments of my moves and the description of um, the tactical and strategic play uh, from its side, I thought its comments were pretty mundane. Um, when I played a move that set up uh, the opportunity for Black to get a passed pawn, it made some comments. But then when I actually did do the, the, the properly wrong move, uh, I think it was uh, playing F4, which um, after take and I recapture with my E pawn, then did result in Black having a passed pawn. When that happened, it didn't make any commentary about, well, you know, having... Uh, to defend against a protected passport is not an easy thing to do. So it did catch some things and it missed others. Uh, on aggregate, I thought its commentary was hit and miss and for the most part, very, um, you know, basic. So depending on your level of chess, uh, that might be something that's very useful or or it might not be. I think there's promise. Don't get me wrong. I think this is going to be uh, a very useful thing. The things that need to uh, improve. Uh, if you do want to use ChatGPT as a substitute for a human chess coach, are uh, one, it needs to get better at chess, and two, it needs to be able to play a whole game of chess without having to pause for three hours to allow for the the whatever the, the threshold is that if you ask too many questions, it you know stops responding for three hours. Those two things need to happen before it really is a prospect for a substitute for a chess coach. That might happen quite quickly though. I don't know.